Well, what a pleasure to be here with you today to be uh, talking about one of Lynn's most distinguished citizens. Can we call Mary Baker Eddy that? Um, you know, I happened to look at Wikipedia just before I left a home to find out notable people from Lynn. I go down the list, I see a football player, uh, someone who won a couple Academy Awards, a television uh, personality, a pro wrestler, um, an actor and a singer, and I'm looking down this list and I'm going, what about Mary Baker Eddy? How has she disappeared from public thought? How has she disappeared from the thought of residents here in Lynn? Um, I understand there was a, a temporary exhibit about her here, um, but nothing permanent uh, yet. Um, I come from the Finger Lakes of central New York, and uh, uh, in the 90s, I had the privilege of putting together a historic exhibit about Mary Baker Eddy's life, along with a number of others, uh, really celebrating her role in advancing women's lives and their rights in the 19th century. They were so happy to have that perspective. And people, when they get to know Mary Baker Eddy, are happy to know about her. She really did some very significant things. And as I look at her time in Lynn, which is what we'll focus on today, I could really say, well, Lynn was the seedbed. It really was a crossroads for her, a time where the woman who came here in 1864 was going to emerge a very different woman. You know, she arrived here in 1864, weak, chronically ill, very dependent, uh, very despondent often, prospects in her life. She was in her 40s. Uh, the woman who emerged from Lynn and went down onto the larger Boston uh, stage was a woman of religious leadership and authority, uh, a published author, uh, a speaker, somebody who would take into the pulpit, was speaking about her ideas. Uh, she was a very different woman. So what happened in Lynn? What took place for this woman? This is what I'd like to, to talk with you about today. Now, this is actually a significant year for uh, talking about Mary Baker Eddy. This, is, this marks the 150th anniversary of Mary Baker Eddy's discovery of Christian science. And some of you may have seen the plaque, the bronze plaque that's near the, the corner there of uh, Market and Oxford Streets, just a few blocks from here, where an event occurred that opened up for her a whole new way of thinking and a whole new life. And we'll talk about that discovery and, and that event. Um, have you been down there to see that plaque? Um, the other thing that's interesting about being in Lynn is there's a couple of homes in this area that are that figure into her history. One is uh, her home in, uh, on Broad Street, where she finished writing her major work, Science and Health. It's the first home she ever owned. And then another, uh, just down a couple blocks from there, is her home in Swampscott, where she had this breakthrough moment, this transforming moment, a, a healing that really shifted her thought and became foundational to her life work. So these historic homes are, are, are you know, right in your neighborhood as well and are important to, uh, to appreciate and see. But let's talk about um, this event that uh, was so significant in her life. 1866, 150 years ago, if you were a resident in Lynn and you'd woken up on Saturday morning, February 3rd, the Lynn reporter would have included this notice. This is part of the historic documentation. Uh, Mrs. Mary M. Patterson, who she was known at that time, of, of Swampscott, fell upon the ice near the corner of Market and Oxford Streets on Thursday evening and was severely injured. She was taken up in an insensible condition and carried into the residence of S.M. Boubier, near, nearby where she was kindly cared for during the night. Dr. Cushing, who was called, found her injuries to be internal and of a very serious nature inducing spasms and intense suffering. Dr. Cushing um, did treat her, and she wanted to be moved uh, when she awakened the next morning uh, at this home. She wanted to be moved back to her home in Swampscott. Um, he gave her some morphine to dull the pain, and she was moved with heavy buffalo robes and uh, uh, by sleigh uh, back, to, um, back to her home. Friends gathered, her husband was out of town, not available to offer her any support, but friends gathered, her minister came to visit her, 
And it was actually her minister who said to her rather bluntly, Mary, you're dying. He just spoke to her in those blunt terms. And I think that was one of the things that really roused her thought, you know, um, to be told you're dying. Uh, she, she was roused to, uh, to make an effort uh, not to give in. And it would have been a very easy time for her to give in. I look at, you know, the, the average lifespan of many women in, at that time was their mid, middle 40s. She'd lived a very hard life, a life of tragedy, a life of illness. During the course of four decades, she'd been ill for much of that time. Uh, she'd lost her first husband to yellow fever. Um, she'd married a second man in an effort to get back her child that was uh, offspring of that first marriage, and he proved to be unfaithful to her. You know, why go on? Why persist? But Mary Baker Eddy was a deeply religious woman. And one of, the, one of her traits was that she never uh, attributed suffering to God. She never blamed the divine nature uh, you know, for suffering, that it was God's will or that it was in any way connected with God. She believed that there was a record of healing in scripture that could be understood and practiced. And she'd actually been pursuing this. One of the leading questions in her life from one of the, uh, her own documents was, again and again I asked myself, what was the method by which Jesus helped the sick and the sinful. She felt that there was a method there, and she was pursuing that. So here we are, um, this is a few days after this accident in early February, and she's feeling oppressed by all of the sympathy and the sadness and the concern about her life. And she asks people to leave her on her own. She uh, recalls opening up to scripture and and opening up to something that she'd probably read many times before. It was an account of Jesus' healing work. But as she read, something profound took place for her. And I want to read to you uh, her words of what took place. This is from one of the early editions of the book that would grow out of this experience. Her book is, is titled Science and Health. It wouldn't be written for about nine years. But this is what she says in one of the early editions. She said, I requested to be left alone. I opened the Bible to the third chapter of Mark, where our master healed the withered hand on the Sabbath day. As I read, the change passed over me. The limbs that were immovable, cold, and without feeling, warmed. The internal agony ceased. My strength came instantaneously, and I rose from my bed and stood upon my feet well. Now, she doesn't go into much explanation there in terms of what was going on for her in her thought. What, what was it that occurred in her thought? Um, but as she uh, clarifies this experience, um, she begins to talk a little bit more about it. Uh, I want to read to you um, her doctor's response, Dr. Cushing's response, because he comes back and finds her on his feet, and he's as startled as anybody is. And this is what she describes um, in an interview. The doctor said, how was this done? I said, I cannot tell you in any wise whatever, except it seemed to me all a thing or state of my mental consciousness. It didn't seem to belong to the body or material condition. When I awakened to this sense of change, I was there, that's all I know. It came to me in a bit of scripture and it's now absent from my thought. And I immediately rose from my bed and before that my feet were dead and they kept something to heat them for fear that they would be stiff utterly. And it seemed to me as I talked to them, to talk to him, I felt a little weakened. And she does record that his surprise and then his saying to her, that's impossible, that she feels weakened by the doctor's thought. Um, he says, uh, it's impossible that, could, that, that that could have been. It must have been the medicine I left for you. I said, your medicine is every bit in the drawer, go look. And there it was in the drawer, and I had not taken a bit of it. When I showed him that, he said, this is impossible. And immediately, I felt I was back again in the old condition, and I staggered. He caught me, set me in a chair, and he said, there, I'll go out. If you've done that much, you can again. My limbs crippled under me just like that when I found myself back again, and I felt more discouraged than ever after the doctor's visit. Well, what happens? She opens her Bible again, she has more time for prayer, and this return of a sense of wellness and wholeness comes to her. 
In her autobiography, which would be written about 25 years after this, um, she, she explains a little bit more about this experience. She says, during 20 years prior to my discovery, I'd been trying to trace all physical effects to a mental cause. And in the latter part of 1866, I gained the scientific certainty that all was mind. And she capitalizes the M there, M there to mean God. All was divine mind and every effect a mental phenomenon. And then she goes on to describe this experience as a falling apple. Now many people who were there at the time wanted to associate it with some sort of miraculous occurrence. This woman has had a severe fall. Some of the records uh, note a, a displacement of the spine. She was knocked unconscious. Remember at this time she was already uh, suffering from years of chronic illness. Uh, Dr. Cushing later would claim to have cured her with his homeopathic uh, powders. Now, I don't know today what scientists would say about homeopathic powders to, you know, to cure serious internal injuries, um, but she said she didn't take them. And um, what did occur for her, though, in describing it as a falling apple, likened to Isaac Newton's falling apple, she felt that a divine law was at work, that it wasn't a miracle. In fact, in her book, Science and Health, that she's going to write, she's, she defines miracle as that which is divinely natural, but must be learned humanly. So she felt that there was a law at work that she could understand and that could be practiced again. And that really distinguishes her. You know, many people refer to this as the, you know, Mary Baker Eddy's falling on the ice story. Um, as I've studied the documents surrounding it, Mary Baker Eddy's writings and, and the context for it, what I'm convinced of is that it really wasn't about a healing of an accident. It was about a breakthrough in her understanding of who she was as a woman. And this profound opening in her thought to the sense of life as being more than flesh and bones, that there's more to us than meets the eye. She's, she's, she's now on a quest to understand that something more. I described her as a very religious woman earlier. Now, she'd grown up with the Bible. She loved the Bible ever, ever since she was a little girl. She loved poring over the Bible, and she found a lot of comfort there. But like many people, you turn to the Bible for comfort, and you turn to doctors for healing, and she was no different. She turned to many medical doctors uh, during her lifetime up to this point in search of healing. And she did suffer from a variety of chronic illnesses. Um, but she found that uh, the, the medical systems of her time weren't bringing permanent relief. And then she began to uh, explore what's known today as mind-body medicine. She began to investigate the types of healing and methods of healing that really do uh, explore more the mind-body effect. You know, what, what's going on in thought has an impact on the body. And she learned some important lessons there. But because she was deeply religious, she wasn't um, really willing to leave healing with the human mind. She was really in pursuit of the mind of Christ. That's what that distinguished her. What was that deep spirituality and that understanding that Jesus had that resulted in healing in people's lives? So when this event occurs for her in 1866, she wants to know what just took place for me. How can I understand that? And she plunged into the Bible. Um, if you go to the Mary Baker Eddy Library in Boston, you will find hundreds of pages of her first notes on the Bible from this time period. And it's breathtaking to read them and to imagine her in the boarding houses in and around Lynn, moving from boarding house to boarding house. If you read the, uh, the diary, her diary and the documents from that time period, she's moving over 20 times between 1866 and 1875 when she first writes her book and begins to share some of the things she's learning. And she's pursuing this understanding of divine healing. Now, one of the places she goes is into the book of Genesis in the Bible, the, the first book of the Bible. And what's interesting in reading her notes is while she'd you know, been close to the Bible all her life, it was like the Bible was becoming a new book for her. And she describes it as a, as a light, uh, an inner light flashing on the pages of the, uh, of the Bible. And she's gaining new insights that she'd never had before. 
one of the primary insights that she gains is the absolute clarity in her thought between that original first chapter Genesis account of creation and the subsequent accounts. And if you know the Bible a little bit, I mean, it's almost um, comic, the, uh, the difference in description between the God of the first chapter, a God of light, of blessing, of goodness, um, creating man and woman in his own image and likeness, no subservience there, there's wholeness, there's blessing, and God saw everything he made and it was very good. And then you get to chapter two and it is absolutely the opposite. My wife teaches Sunday school and loves teaching the young kids and she calls this the upside down creation. Instead of beginning with light, it begins with mist. Instead of creating man in the image and likeness of God, you have man made of the dust of the earth. And woman, sorry, you're pulled out of Adam's rib and you're now subservient to him. And there's a serpent in this second account that is going to trick these, uh, these children and convince them to eat the knowledge of good and evil. And a result, as a result of that, everyone to this day is punished for that mistake. Well, the clarity in her thought as you read through these notes and the growing understanding that she's gaining is that Genesis 1 precludes Genesis 2. It makes it impossible. You can't have God both ways. She begins to see that the clarity that Jesus had as a divine healer was that that first account was the authentic account. This is what she would call the spiritual record, a God of love, a God of spirit, creating in his own image and likeness, creating everything good to reflect that divine nature. And she sees that's what Jesus understood when he said, for example, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. A good tree produces good fruit, he taught. Like produces like. What is God like? That was a big part of her exploration during this time period. What is God like? Well, you, you go into the Gospels and you find that God is like love. The essence of God's nature is love. God is like spirit. The substance of God is not fleshly. It's spiritual. You know, God is truth, immutable, immortal, and has created his own children in that image and likeness. So what about the rest of the stuff? What about illness? What about those chronic, those decades of suffering that she'd been through? Well, she begins to see that Genesis 2 and 3 are a description of the human mind's misconception of life, the distorted view of health, the distorted view of God that actually is the cause of human suffering and that it is the function of the Christ, that eternal truth that Jesus taught, to awaken us from that Adam dream, that misconception. Now these are big ideas to digest over lunchtime. <laughs> these are bold ideas for a woman uh, in the 19th century, a woman with no academic credentials, she was largely self-educated, very well educated, but self-educated, um, no college degree. She begins to write, write these ideas down and more than that, she begins to take these concepts into the streets of Lynn, into the boarding places where, where she lives, and she begins to practice them. Now she will call this the science of Christianity, that what you learn in the Bible, these spiritual ideas can be put into practice. Um, she felt that Jesus had taken students because he wanted the students to carry on this healing work. That was actually a very radical notion in the 19th century. Many people believe that healing in biblical times was a special dispensation, only possible in biblical times, but not afterwards. And she said, no, why, why would Jesus take students? Why would he say, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free? Why would he say, the works that I do, you will do also? Because he was a teacher. He was teaching people about the spiritual nature of life and healing, and he wanted them to carry that on. Well. A couple of examples here, and to me it's very touching to think about Mary Baker Eddy's work in Lynn and how quietly and profoundly it took place. Um, who would have known that this woman living in a boarding house was doing this kind of work? And this is just a couple of examples to share with you. And these are corroborated by people who witnessed the healings or knew people close to them. This first one from Margaret Harding. Um, she says sometime during 1865 or 1866, and it's borne out that this was in fact 1866, 
Mrs. Mort Mrs. Norton drove her young son George to Lynn Beach for a day's outing. At the time, George was about seven years of age and had been carried on a pillow since birth, having been born with a deformity commonly known as club feet, both feet being turned backward and consequently he'd never walked. Mrs. Norton laid the child upon the pillow on the sand and left him alone while, while she hitched the horse and went for water. On her return shortly, the child had disappeared and the mother searched bewilderedly about, only to find him down by the water walking with a woman holding his hands, which she released a moment later and George stood alone. Later, he took a few steps and from that time on, to walk, he was able to walk. The strange woman and the mother both looked into each other's eyes, wept a little, and thanked God for this seemingly miraculous healing. That's one of the earliest accounts we have of her work. She wasn't a theorist. She wasn't a philosopher. She was gaining insights during the day in her research into the Bible, and then she was out putting them into practice. You know, if you lived in Lynn in uh, the 19th century, they didn't shelve you away in large uh, hospitals away from public view. People who were ill were ill at home, largely. And they were being treated at home by doctors and, and family physicians. So when somebody was ill, you knew about it. And if you were living in a boarding house, you heard it, perhaps in the wall next to you. So many of Mary Baker Eddy's uh, early healings were those that she was living with in these boarding houses and became aware of their, um, their problems. This is a woman who uh, comes down from Beverly. She says, uh, in about the year 1876 or 1877, uh, when Mrs. Eddy was living on Broad Street in Lynn, I was living nearby in Beverly and was very ill with pain in the abdomen and the doctor had not been able to relieve me. Someone pr proposed that I go to Lynn to see the quote, medium who healed without medicine. A lot of speculation about Mary Baker Eddy. You know, Many people didn't see her as a Christian woman. They saw her as an unusual woman. Some called her a medium, uh, which she clearly never saw herself. Um, I said that I did not care who it was if they would help me. So I went to Lynn to see her. Mrs. Eddy opened the door herself and invited me in. I told her what seemed to be the matter and she talked with me a few minutes and then said, now we won't talk anymore. She closed her eyes and sat with her hands in her lap for about 10 minutes and then she said, you will not have trouble anymore. And I said, aren't you going to rub me or do anything? And she said, you are healed. And I was. As I went back to the carriage, I said to the friends that it was the queerest kind of healing I'd ever heard of, for she did not even look at my tongue or feel my pulse. When I asked Mrs. Eddy how much I owed her, she said 50 cents, but I was healed and never had this pain again. You can imagine some of the speculation that would grow up around this, these kinds of experiences. In Lynn, um, you know, if you were uh, doing things that women weren't accustomed to doing at that time, you could earn a, a strange reputation. And Mary Baker Eddy was saying things, uh, writing things about scripture that had never really been proposed before. Her ideas were revolutionary. I have with me today uh, at the end of this talk, I'm happy to show you a, a, the first edition of her book, which was published in 1875. Um, she, she speaks in the preface of that book. She says, the time for thinkers has come and the time for revolutions, ecclesiastic and social must come. She was a revolutionary. Her ideas flowed from her, her understanding of, of scripture. And um, you know, the, the book that she would eventually write uh, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, when it was first published in 1875, uh, she describes critics taking pleasure in saying that book will never be read. And in the first couple of years, they seemed to be right. She'd published a thousand copies of Science and Health with her own funds, which were tight at the time. And after a couple of years, several hundred copies of this book had been sold. But what's so unique about her history is that if you look at um, the, the reader by reader effect of her book starting at this date and moving forward. There's no question that Mary Baker Eddy got her start as a religious author and thinker and healer from the effect that her writings had in people's lives. And um, uh, her book, Science and Health, did go on to become an American bestseller. 
um, one of the most checked out books in American libraries, uh, one of the most popular books. It was a book that literally revived the practice of Christian healing in the United States and abroad. And the last chapter of her book, she devotes to her reader. She calls it Fruitage. And it contains account after account of people's healing experiences that resulted from their reading her book. Now, how do you heal serious physical conditions by reading a book? How does that actually take place? Um, I want to give you a couple of examples of what you'll find in the chapter on fruitage. Um, and, and let's talk about um, how healing occurs. Uh, this, this gentleman writes, as the son of a physician, a graduate in pharmacy and an ex-druggist, I had a perfect contempt for what I thought Christian science to be. About six and a half years ago, however, having exhausted all material means at my command, materia medica, electricity, gymnastics, cycling, and so on, and being in a hopeless state, the study of Christian science was taken up. I had been a sufferer from catarrh and sore throat for over 30 years, and the last five were added several others, including dyspepsia and bronchitis, and a loss in flesh of about 60 pounds. I was completely healed and regained health, strength, and flesh through the spiritual understanding of Christian science, the result of about six weeks study. While most grateful for the physical healing, my gratitude for the mental and spiritual regeneration is beyond expression. When I learned that Jesus' mission of healing sickness as well as sin did not end with his short stay upon earth, but is practical in all ages, my joy was unbounded. People describe invariably in that chapter a mental and spiritual and moral transformation that's occurring. Thought is shifting from seeing themselves as hopeless sinners, hopeless sufferers, to seeing themselves as the blessed and loved children of God, and to seeing them as God's very own expression. It's a big theme in Mary Baker Eddy's writings that if we understand the nature of God, for example, as spirit, as love, as truth, as divine principle, the lawmaker, then what God is creating in reality must reflect that wholeness, that integrity, that beauty, that perfection. And that change in thought from seeing oneself as a sinner, as a sufferer, as hopelessly uh, lost in some uh, illness, that that shift in thought has a profound effect on the body. Now, the practice of Christian science you know, began with Mary Baker Eddy's work in the 1860s and 1870s, but she saw quite quickly that it couldn't be dependent on her, that she was not a char charismatic healer, she was not a personal healer, that she was somebody who had discovered a Christian truth, a truth about early Christianity, and that she wanted more than anything to pass that along. And uh, you know, as well as I do, that Lynn was uh, shoe factories, was one of the main uh, economies here. So some of her first students came from those shoe factories. And over candlelight and those you know, discussions in the boarding houses, she talked with these Lynn uh, shoe workers about these concepts that she was gaining. And she found, and they found, that they were able to heal using the same ideas the same understanding of the Bible was it enabled them to heal as well as she was. That's really where Christian science began to take root and, and to, to move forward, is the work of others who were demonstrating these, these same ideas. Um, I, I mentioned the 20 year period when she lived in Lynn and I could re review for you very quickly um, this time capsule from 1864, June, when she showed up here to 1882 in January, that Mary Baker Eddy emerged from being a weak and ill and helpless woman to being a woman of stature and strength and authority, a woman who became a very successful teacher, a publisher, a writer, a businesswoman, um, a preacher who preached in pulpits here and in Boston, and eventually a, a world religious leader. Um, Christian science began right here in the city of Lynn and it has stretched around the globe ever since then. There are uh, practicing Christian scientists all over the globe. People of many different denominations practice uh, this, this teaching. Uh, she never saw Christian science as an exclusive teaching. She saw it as a universal truth. 
the truth about how Jesus healed, the science of Christianity. She believed that that truth belonged to everyone. And early on, her first efforts were to go and share this with the churches right here in Lynn. And unfortunately, they weren't ready for it. Um, the pastors, others, you know, closed their door on her and her ideas, and that's when she began a church of her own. And it was actually uh, down on Broad Street, if you want to drive by that, you know, sweet little home down there, um, that home served as a, a, a base for the uh, early teaching that she did, which actually became a college for teaching metaphysical healing to others, and then moved to Boston and expanded. Um, but all these things took place right in your neighborhood. This remarkable woman had her start right here in Lynn, Massachusetts. I mentioned that she always envisioned this work as being universal. And one of my great privileges in, in talking about her life and doing a lot of traveling is meeting people all around the globe, you know, from villages in Africa to um, Baguio, the Philippines, high up in the, the, the countryside there, um, to downtown London, to Nairobi, Kenya, um, and to see the, the lives that Mary Baker Eddy has touched through her writing and, and thinking. Um, people have felt profoundly impacted by her writing and by her major work, Science and Health, with Key to the Scriptures. And um, I think it's a great time to be rediscovering her. I'm grateful to be here with you today to offer some insights on her life and happy to open this up to questions. I, I don't want you to, to leave without being able to ask a few questions you may have about her life and about her life in Lynn. Oh, yes. You know, I'm really glad I came today to hear this about her because I wouldn't have thought I would have any connection with this woman from what I thought I knew about her, which was practically nothing. However, as you went through all of this, I found a very strong connection with the ideals Hmm. of her healing and how she went on from there. And as a practicing Roman Catholic, I find it very exciting to yeah. hear yeah. that this woman shared some of the same ideals that I share. Oh, thank you. I, I just, thank you. I'm really amazed by that. She, she didn't see herself as different from any other practicing Christian. You know, she really didn't. Um, so, yeah. Um, another question? Yeah. Um, a motto for the city of Lynn is the city of firsts, and so she had a lot of firsts here. Yes. Did your research give you any insights into why Lynn was such a good seedbed to nurture? No, um, I wish I, I'm glad to be in the museum today. I, I need to know more about Lynn. My impression, though, from the, the research that I've done, the little research that I've done, was that Lynn was open-minded that there was a, a mix of people and cultures and ideals. There was a tolerance. You know, I think Mary Baker Eddy in those early years needed tolerance. You know, she needed enough openness of thought that she could begin to practice spiritual healing. Um, had she been in other environments, it might have just been clamped down and run out of town. But Lynn seemed to be an environment that um, nurtured that reform. She grew up in the Puritan tradition in the sense the Puritans believed that everybody had their own relationship to the Bible and to God and you didn't need somebody to be an intermediary for you. That you could really get to know God individually and on your own and that, um, that God could be revealed to you through your own study of the Bible. And I think it's one of the things that many people who study Christian science appreciate is it's, it's about encouraging you to think deeply and think spiritually and to think for yourself. Yes? At the monument that uh, Mike and Monroe, is, is that um, revealed to be the exact location in which the fall mm -hmm. occurred? Yes. Is that, in, that is Yes, right, right near there is the way it's described in the, in the newspaper account, near the corner of Market and Oxford, Market and Monroe. Um, that's, that's where accounts uh, show her walking to a temperance, temperance meeting. She was a member of the, the Temperance Society in Lynn, an advocate for um, people getting off alcohol. She saw the, the ills that alcohol had, particularly the abuse of women. So she was a very strong uh, advocate for uh, temperance. And, um, you know, the accounts uh, describe a falling uh, across a granite cur curbstone there, a dislocated spine. Uh, being knocked unconscious. Um, it was a fairly severe fall. 
Um, but it was right, right in that area. And how important is that site for modelers or practitioners of the thing? Is there a design or is it just yeah. like yeah. that? Yeah. But occasion in which people want yeah. to look at that, or is it more of an abstract? You know, it was a local artist. It was a local artist who wanted to commemorate uh, that uh, the Christian Science from Church from the Hunt. From the Hunt. Yes. Um, he wanted to commemorate that um, and did that uh, on his own. Um, the church has never tried to put something there as a kind of memorial about it. I, I don't think Mary Baker Eddy saw it as any kind of sacred site. You know, in fact, um, she she describes this experience. Um, you know, it was the um, more the insights that grew out of the prayer in the following days that she would really call the discovery of Christian Science, where the this this understanding began to dawn in her thoughts, so not the event itself. Uh, the, the fall on the ice. Um, but to me, it wasn't, it wasn't so much the, the healing of the injury that was the, the real experience for her. Uh, because you can, you can really contest what took place and how it took place and was she healed and all this sort of stuff. But there's no question, according to history, that the woman who emerged from this experience in 1866 and during that year was a profoundly different woman. She no longer suffered from chronic illness, which she had had ever since she was a child. She was no longer weak. She had a deep sense of life purpose. She had seen something, glimpsed something, that really did fire her. You know, somebody who's seen something important and wanting to share it. So uh, I, I really think that that's the more important aspect of that whole experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How did she go from being Mary Patterson to Mary Baker? Good question. How did she go from becoming, you know, well, Mary Patterson, Daniel Patterson was an itinerant dentist uh, who she had married. Um, you know, biographers look at this and say, well, she was a woman who, when she'd lost her child, who was a result of her first marriage, and her husband had died, um, she was penniless, and she, she was too ill to care for her son. Her father actually had legal custody of her son. Her father made the decision that her son was going to live with uh, a local family in New Hampshire. And then the family seems to have uh, arranged for them to move to the Midwest. The, the Baker family, perhaps Mary's sister, um, they didn't let her know what was happening, but off he went, this, this young boy, to the Midwest. And she was crushed, you know, uh, because she loved her son deeply. Um, her marriage to Daniel Patterson in part, biographers feel, was to get her son back. Only by being married would she have the, you know, the possibility of getting her son back. So Patterson, she was married to Patterson um, you know, in the 50s and up through about 74. So it was about a 20 year period. Um, but he actually abandoned her in 1866. So last time, I mean, he wasn't present uh, during this accident. He was philandering. He was, uh, uh, she was aware um, this was part of what was crushing her at the time, was her husband's infidelity. And so he was not present, and then he did show back up again, and then he left again. And um, I think he made one more appearance when she was staying with uh, a minister in Lynn, and the minister told him to get out of town quick <laughs> before he did something uh, to him. So P Patterson proved to be a, a very unfaithful man, but how she became Mary Baker Eddy. Asa Gilbert Eddy was a man that she met here in Lynn. I like to think of Asa Gilbert as a 21st century man. I mean, this was a guy who was uh, deeply touched and healed by Mary Baker Eddy's work um, and her writing, and th they became very close and uh, married in, uh, I believe it was 1877, and he became an absolute support to her and uh, was known scrubbing the floors, helping with dinner, doing everything he could to support her work. And I think of him as a very, very progressive thinker. Um, so Mary Baker Eddy emerged from Lynn and from that very happy union that took place um, after she divorced Patterson. So Baker was her first husband's name? Baker was her family name. Her family. Yeah, she grew up in rural New Hampshire, um, the sixth child of a farming family in New Hampshire. And um, so she was born, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, again, critics have had uh, a good time talking about the thrice married Mary Baker Eddy and you know, trying to paint a picture of somebody who was you know, uh, loose or whatever. She was a, a deeply Christian woman. 
and um, you know, um, very loyal, very faithful. Even Patterson, um, after he deserted her and left her, it was a long time before she went through with the divorce proceedings because she you know, didn't believe in divorce. But in order to move forward at a, at a point in her, her work and her life, she did feel that that was an essential thing to do. So um, she did eventually divorce him. Did she ever see her son? Oh yes, she did. She was reunited with her son um, as an adult, as a grown man. Um, this young boy had been raised in a pretty rough way and had actually gone and gotten into the Civil War um, as a teenager and been wounded. It was an interesting experience in her life that she was um, aware of his need, um, just felt intuitively that he was in deep trouble and, and prayed for him at a point during the Civil War. And he, um, he recovered from an accident that surgeons felt he was going to die from in the Civil War. And, um, and then uh, they found out about each other, their whereabouts, and he came and, and uh, saw her again. And, and she uh, made very generous provision for, for him, uh, bought him a home and you know, helped to educate his children. And um, so it was uh, you know, a lot of love expressed there. Yeah. Do they know why she came to Lynn for this? Why did she come down to Lynn? Well, it seems that she came to Lynn um, for her husband's dental practice. So Patterson was setting up a dental practice in 18, at the end of 1863. She rejoined him in 64 and um, had been living, I think, prior to that up in Maine. Uh, so, so you said she came to Lynn in 1842? No, 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 18, 1864. 1864, she was here from June of 1864 to January of 1882, so almost 20 years. And Lynn truly was the seedbed. I mean, I, I, I like to think of it as a seedbed, a place where the soil is, is, is being nourished, nourished and, and enriched. And she was teaching people quietly, uh, workers from the local factories and others, uh, housewives. She was teaching these principles of healing. All the while, seeds were being planted. It was really in the 1880s and 90s that Christian science sprung up. And by 1900, there were a couple of churches every week springing up across this country. Christian science as a movement was growing like wildfire. It was um, really proving to be a, 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 a very um, important religious movement. And the, the substance of that movement is very, very much in, in uh, at work today. I mean, the Christian Science Church, it's headquartered, as you know, in Boston. And um, uh, Mary Baker Eddy, one of the last things she did was founded a newspaper, the Christian Science Monitor. It's won several Pulitzer Prizes. It's a very uh, progressive paper that's about uh, seeking out solutions to world issues, not just reporting the problems, although it does tackle the problems. But she felt that the news and the media um, could have a very detrimental effect on society's health not only people's sense of um, what is really going on in the world by just reporting the negative, but also the fears that the media would sometimes uh, sometime spread by reporting illness with long descriptions of illness and making people afraid of it. She really did feel that the media needed to express more responsibility about how it was reporting. And so the Christian Science Monitor is not a religious paper, but it's a paper that believes in advancing humanity and, and looking deeply into the news rather than just reporting on the surface events. Yeah, yeah. Yes? I just have two questions, so you sure. can pick whichever one is more interesting to you. Yes. Um, but there are a number of accounts that she was dabbling in spiritualism, had sat in spiritualist circles, et cetera, yes. prior to the founding of, of her church and coming to her beliefs. I'm sort of curious about that. Sure. And then um, the other one is, you know, the other woman in Lynn at the time that was growing of equal stature and, and um, yes. is Lydia Pinkham. Yes. So I'm wondering, and they were both interested in sure. the temperance and, you know, women's, yep. women's health. And, yep. You know, so what yep. about, do you, what do you know about that relationship? Yeah, that's good. Thank you for asking. Well, in her book, she has a, a whole chapter on spiritualism. Uh, but it's, it's called Christian Science versus Spiritualism. <laughs> so she, she actually, um, you know, in this chapter, which um, uh, there's a wonderful um, professor at Harvard Medical or Harvard uh, Seminary, a religious seminary, that's uh, 
Anne Browdy has written a book called Radical Spirits. She talks about spiritualism in America. And it actually grew up near where I live, the Rochester Wrapping, you know, a time when so many people were seeking some sort of confirmation that their loved ones who'd been lost in the Civil War, I mean, millions, I mean, not millions, hundreds of thousands, um, had been lost and they wanted to know, are they okay? And this wrapping experience happens in Rochester and it spreads like wildfire that people are wanting to communicate with those that they'd lost. Uh, Mary Baker Eddy had lost people very close to her as well. Um, in her chapter, she um, is very clear in her own reasoning that those who have died, passed on, are in a different state of consciousness, the, the way she would describe it, um, and not able to commune with people here on Earth. That it's, um, she has a sense of, she says it would be like a, a, a butterfly communing with a caterpillar. You know, they're in a different state. It's a different, different state of thought and experience. And so she doesn't, she doesn't um, buy into the spiritualist's uh, philosophy, but she does have a great deal of respect for many of the people themselves. Um, many of the spiritualists that uh, she may have come in contact with um, were people seeking out a deeper spiritual experience. They were tired of, um, you know, the, the religion that was of doctrine and were looking for something of the heart and looking for a deeper spirituality. And she had great respect for that. So I think in, in, in the early days, you can even find her advertising her classes on healing in the Banner of Light, which was a spiritualist magazine of the time, because she felt that many people that were, that were open-minded spiritually would be likely to be interested in what she was doing. Lydia Pinkham, I wish I knew more about any contact there. I don't believe in the Mary Baker Eddy Library that you can find any correspondence between them. Um, they certainly would have known about each other, and you're right, the, the temperance connection uh, was, was important. Um, Lydia Pinkham today is easier to talk about. I mean, I think she has a place in this museum. I mean, you know, Mary Baker Eddy was a controversial deeply you know, religious figure. So um, sometimes people are shy about uh, you know, getting into her life, but you, you can't deny the achievement, um, uh, that the achievements that surround her life. In fact, uh, one of the first exhibits I worked on as a creative director in the 90s was an exhibit for the Women's Rights National Historic Park in Seneca Falls. And they were blown away by her life and her work and her achievements. Like, where has she been? Why don't we have her on our radar? And um, so that exhibit was, a, was an important one to work on. Um, there are films that are in process right now, people that are working on some major films about her life. And um, I've had some involvement with some of the early work in, in those films. I do hope a film is made about her because um, you know, when, you, when you get to know Mary Baker Eddy, you find a deeply uh, spiritual, Christian, um, humanitarian, somebody who toward the end of her life, she says, all my work, all my efforts, all my prayers and tears are for humanity and the spread of peace and love among mankind. She really, um, her driving motive was to alleviate human suffering. And I think it's a beautiful time to be rediscovering her today because so many people find themselves on a similar path. You know, she was a woman that was desperately ill, looking into the healing systems of her time, exploring alternative healing, looking into this link between mind and body, and then finding right in the scriptures that that link existed. But it wasn't leaving healing with the brain or the human mind. It was linking it to this spiritual mindedness that Jesus expressed, the love for one's neighbor, the integrity, the, um, the love for God. I mean, she felt that it was that that um, enlightened mind of Christ that was the source of healing. So um, that's a beautiful story. I think people today are hungry for uh, a deeper spiritual experience in their lives.